And uh, we'd just like to welcome you to today's session. Uh, today we have a very interesting session. Um, I believe you've all uh, seen it. We are talking about planning your retirement and basically financial wellness and basically managing successful planning. We have a very interesting guest speaker. But before we start, I'll allow our chairperson, Catherine, to give some remarks uh, before we start the session. My name is Eunice Kuria. Um, I'm a banker by profession. I'm a member of Women on Board Web, uh, Network. And I also sit in one of the committees for uh, advocacy. And, and um, I'm, I'm happy to be here and to be your moderator today. So Catherine, welcome and give your opening remarks as the chairperson. Karine. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eunice. Good evening, everybody. Good morning for some of you who may be joining us from elsewhere. It's always a pleasure to end the week with my um, uh, colleagues within the network um, because the discussions that we have are always so stimulating. And sometimes you just want the weekend to be there so that you can use it to marinate on some of the ideas that are shared. And so today it's really a pleasure to um, have this discussion it's never too early to begin to speak about your future, your retirement, your succession matters, so on and so forth. And so indeed, looking forward to hearing from Jospin and looking forward to interacting with you. Karibuni sana and please enjoy the session, make it interactive so that we have a lot to talk about over the weekend as we, you know, we recharge for the following week. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. So allow me to introduce our speaker today. Um, she says she's, she's, she's retired, but I'm sure she has a lot to tell us. Uh, our speaker today is Josephine Wayua Wambua Mungare. She's a chair of Emi, Emeritus, uh, FIDA Kenya, member of Women on Boards and uh, Network, ICJ, FIDA, and LSK, advocate of the High Court of Kenya since 1991. The current boards she's sitting on are Mbaito, USA, Stroke Canada, uh, Churchill Foundation, Touch a Child's, a Child's Heart, USA. Previous uh, board memberships, she's been uh, a member, uh, a board member at FIDA Kenya for eight years. Uh, which she was a chair in 2012 uh, up to 2020. Uh, Public Procurement Administrative uh, Review Board, uh, she, uh, six years. Nairobi Water and Sewage, Sewerage uh, Board, 2004-2007. LSK, uh, CCPD, 2008-2018. Kenya Youth Community Empowerment Program, NGO. Silverbird uh, Travel, BOM. Uh, Ushirika Secondary Dandora, and she, she, she's a partner of J.W. Wambua and Company Advocates, uh, serial entrepreneur, a farmer, a volunteer, a mother, a wife, and I'm sure she's going to tell us uh, much more uh, of who she is. So Josephine, we welcome you. Uh, thank you for accepting to be with us. Um, we welcome you to just take us through this session. Uh, for everyone else on the call, uh, feel free to send your questions as we go, go on with the session and feel free to, to, to also, after, even after the session, put your hand up uh, for, for any questions you may have or comments. So welcome, Josephine, and thank you for joining us. Tell us where you're joining us from and tell us a bit more. I'm sure I just did a bit of your introduction. Thank you. Good morning, uh, good morning, my sisters and brothers, if there are any on the call. Um, I am uh, signing in from Los Angeles, California. As you've heard, I am chair emeritus, meaning I am the retired immediate chair of FIDA. I retired in 2020, and therefore I am emeritus, means that I'm retired. Uh, <clears throat> and it is 8.43 a.m. where I am. Uh, it's not very cold today, it's a little bit warm, and we expect rain tomorrow. <laughs> uh, they keep warning us, but I haven't seen any rain in three years. 
Um, I saw when I saw uh, the invitation to come and speak to you, I was rather disappointed because it was uh, mapped to people over 50. And I thought that uh, that was a misdirection. And I hope people younger than 50 have joined this meeting. Because um, I wish uh, someone invited me to a similar meeting 20 years ago. I've been a lawyer for the last 30 years. I was admitted to the bar in 1991. And I was, um, I have practiced law for 30 continuous years with interruptions in between to serve in public service because I did serve in um, uh, Kenya and Corruption Commission as an employee for three years. And in between I have served in various boards as you've been told. Um, so I was asked uh, by Catherine and the team to whom I'm very grateful for this opportunity to just share uh, what it means to not really to, 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 to how, how do you get uh, retirement prepared? And that's what I'm saying. I wish somebody told me this 10 years into my practice because I was a sole practitioner for a very long time. And that, what that means is that um, everything in the law firm from sourcing to work, marketing, billing, making sure the work is done, managing client expectation rested entirely on my shoulders for a very long time. Uh, and so I was not retirement ready. In 2018, November, I remember the day very well because I had very big plans for myself. While at the height of what I considered my career, my husband was posted to the US as a consular officer at the embassy. And uh, we were first posted in New York and then we were moved to Los Angeles. Um, when we finally came. And believe you me, at that time, Jocelyn, the serial entrepreneur and farmer had 5,000 chicken layers in my farm. I had opened three branches of my law farm because I was preparing to retire from FIDA, but now dive, dive seriously into my practice. So I had a law practice in Nairobi, a law practice in Makweni, and a law practice in Kitangela, near where I live. So I had all those three offices that were at formation stage. But remember, I was a sole entrepreneur, sole proprietor. I was a single, the single most important person in the law firm. I had to quickly think on my feet because uh, for those of you who may be in marital relationships, I've been married for 25 years. There are things you plan as a couple and there are positions that come and they call for serious reflection as a family. Because at that time, my husband told me that the decision to make was mine. Do I go with them? Do I continue flying my flag in Kenya? Or do I, uh, you know, what do I do? So he told me no pressure, think about it. This is a good opportunity. This is my, he's been in public service for over 20 years. This is the highlight of my career, but I will be the last person to stop you if you say you cannot come. So because I got married for better, for worse in sickness and health, <laughs> and to support my husband, I had to make the decision for the family to move. I was not prepared to leave my baby in the practice. I had these three law firms that I had, three branches that I was trying to grow. And I was the single important most person in that practice. I also was actively engaged as a board member at the public procurement. I was also the chair of FIDA and the spokesperson of FIDA at that point. And uh, so I had a very full plate, if I would say in terms of uh, uh, career. And so I made the decision to move from Kenya with my family. I have little kids. I have a seven-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 17-year-old now. They were then 10, 15, and five. 
because my children have a five-year gap. And so I had to make a decision for them. And so I moved with them. And that's why I'm saying, I wish someone had prepared me 10 years before today. Because we all understand retirement as if you're in public service when you hit 60 and you have to go home, if you are practicing out there in your own business when you no longer want to wake up and go to work, we never think that some changes, some decisions you are forced to make in life can make you have to change, you know, to take retirement when you're not retirement ready. And so I had to do a lot of balancing. Uh, fortunately, at FIDA, we served as a board and I had a vice chair. So I was able to offload uh, the leadership role, not entirely, but at least have someone on the ground to hold FIDA uh, while I moved. At public procurement, I was released because I was coming to the end of my term. And that because it was a government entity, so I was uh, let go when the time came. But at JW Wambua, I had to seriously make life-changing decisions. And so I had to quickly uh, look at the people who are in my law firm and have a serious discussion on what they could do. And so the decision was, do I close the law firm and just go and ask my clients, please come and pick your files. But this is a fixed term uh, appointment for four years. Then what do I do when I come back? Because at one time when I went to government, I almost closed the farm then and I had to come back. I had to start from the scratch, which, which, which is not very exciting. So I invited one of my colleagues to take on partnership because having not prepared previously to leave someone responsible in the farm, I suffered a lot of hits when I came back to practice, including settling claims that had been managed uh, not properly by people who had left the practice with. And I didn't want to come to that uh, whatever. So I had to cede a lot of ground and cede my authority and control to the farm. And I took uh, my new partner. She had fortunately been with me for close to six years at that point. She was my associate. And I took her to my clients and I told them, the law firm of JW Wambua, I am going away, first of all, I told them. The law firm of JW Wambua will continue to exist. I hope you continue to support us. This is the person in charge. So I took her around to all the clients and I managed her uh, to be able to introduce herself and get known now as the face of the farm. Of course, it took a while and uh, we took a hit, but not that bad. It was better than when I went to government. So that is when I started thinking, uh, how ready are we to retire? How ready are we to let go? We now serve, this is women's on board. Most of you serve in positions of authority, your managers, your CEOs, your board members. You have all these uh, um, uh, positions that make you very, very busy, make you very, very visible, make you, engaged mentally and physically. But we don't stop to think and say, what if? Because I never had a what if. Me, I was on the verge of, I was going to have a region, a law firm, I mean, a thriving big law practice with very many lawyers. Uh, and I was gearing to that because I had practiced on my own for close to 20 years. And so I want to pause here and ask you people, what do you think retirement is? Is it when in government you reach 65 years? Is it when there is an interruption in your life? Is it when you can no longer go to work? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I looked at the definition of retirement in Wikipedia and it says, retirement is the withdrawal from one's position or occupation or from one's active working life. You could retire or semi-retire by reducing your working hours. But most people choose to retire when they are old because they think that, uh, or for even reasons other than just age, you could retire because maybe the work that you do, you've suffered some 
complication that does not allow you to work, uh, to continue doing what you're doing. But it's determined the end of life. What do you do when you find yourself in a position like I found myself in 2019? So uh, I didn't think I was retired until I reached the United States. And uh, let me tell you, as you say in Kenya, like a good reminder, the village hen, <laughs> or is it the cock hen? In the village, Jogo Ashamba, a week in Jin. <laughs> you leave Kenya, you come to the United States. You are the feeder chair. You are in the board of public procurement. You are a member of women's on board. You are the CEO. But no one cares. No one wants to know who you are. Who are you? I mean, what is that? What is FIDA? Huh? What are you talking about? I mean, what, what is this thing that you think you are? So I came with the conception that I was in an international NGO. So I was able to sell my credentials here and uh, quickly get absorbed. But I was in for a shock. I realized I was a Jogo Asham. And this was Mujini. And uh, therefore, I had to quickly adjust my expectations and uh, deal with the realities of life. And one reality was waking up to no appointment, to no court appearance, to no phone calls, to nothing. I arrived, my children joined school, my husband started working, and he was very busy because he came with the Uduma cards. And they were working until 11 because it was summer and the sun would set quite late. And so I would be in the house from eight to four when my children come from school and to 11 when my husband comes from work. First of all, without an adult to speak to, without any friends, America is a very hostile place, most of you who have lived here, people take very long, warm up to you. I live in a big street, but I don't know my next door, two next door neighbors. And I would be in the house all alone with the television. And remember, because of time difference, it is at night when it's morning here. So I can only speak to people in Kenya for like one hour, between eight and nine, and they go to sleep. And I was on my own. I was my own company. And remember, as uh, Catherine says, I'm not only social, I suffer from ADHD. And what is that thing, that uh, activity? Uh, Nancy, my vice chair, used to say I have uh, the syndrome for very hyperactive children. Uh, it's a disease here in America, it's treatable, but in Kenya it's not. So I have to be on the move and I have to be engaged. <laughs> and so I, reality hit me three months later that Things weren't going to get any better. No one was going to recognize. One, one of the things that I did were, because my children went to a private school, I went to the private school and I met the head teacher. And I said, do you have any lawyers in your community? Can you introduce me to a few? And he did. But everybody says, oh, do you have the California bar? Who could recommend you? Do you have the California bar? Oh, have you, are, you, are you admitted to any state bar? Then I'm like, I just came. I'm admitted to the Kenyan bar. What is that? <laughs> and so reality hit me that uh, maybe I was climbing the tree from the top. <laughs> I had to start from the beginning. And uh, this is why um, I think all of us, at whatever point we find ourselves in life, need to seriously think about what happens to you when you no longer have um, that big job that you have so many uh, appointments that the day is not enough. 24 hours are not enough. How do you fill your time? How do you, because retirement doesn't mean, uh, I mean, uh, that uh, your mind doesn't go to sleep because you're not going to the office. And I, I watched a little bit of TV, I started hating the television. Uh, I, I no longer watch TV. I, it almost got me depressed because the news are repetitive. 
I went on YouTube, watched a few clips. I followed Kenyan news. I left. Uh, so I asked myself what to do. And so I started trying to find networks here in Kenya and to see what I could do. And so I came up with a brilliant idea of going to Clark in a law firm. And so this person gave me an opportunity to clerk in a law firm. I remember telling one of my friends, oh, you know what I'm doing? I'm in this immigration law firm. I do this, this, this. And she laughed so hard and she called me the name of my clerk. She said, oh, so you are Karuko now. Karuko was my long serving clerk. <laughs> I felt so bad. <laughs> I felt like crying. And I said, no, uh, I'm just trying to understand the law, uh, keep myself busy. But I also had other issues because as a diplomat's wife, it gets, takes a while to be allowed to work. I still am not allowed to work and the law firm had to let me go. And so in my retirement, I became creative and I went to school. So 2020 was a little bit good. I was able to go to school and take a degree. Although the COVID happened, so I took the degree from home. And so for me, I asked myself today, what would I have done differently if I knew in 2018, I would be asked to make the hard decision of moving from my very active life to a life where I didn't have enough things to fill my day. Maybe I would have started uh, um, a writing career, which I could do from where I was. Maybe I would have started doing things that required to allow me to continue being engaged um, uh, while I was outside. At least with the onset of Zoom, I make sure that I join most events that uh, people invite me to and listen to other people. Uh, so today's topic um, is very close to my heart because most of us, even at 60 years, are not retirement ready. Most of us are not prepared for that big emptiness in your life. Uh, my father-in-law passed on last year, but I remember when I got married, he was newly retired. And it was at the height of the constitution. And he was, uh, he was an educationist, he was an educated man. And he wrote a treatise of the Kenyan constitution. And I was wondering, why is this man wasting his time? Now I understand what he was trying to do. He was trying to keep his mind engaged. He wrote a very big treatise, which he made me type for him. I was newly married, still trying to impress my in-laws. So I typed uh, close to a 300 page document, which he sent to CKRC when they were sitting alone. And he wrote very great ideas and contributed to the chapter on citizenship and uh, national world. Uh, and so for me, um, what I see today as being important to all of us is, what do you do to be retirement ready? When in public service, those of you who have served in public service, you know there are certain uh, job groups that uh, you cannot attain until you go for a training called strategic management course, course and uh, senior management course. And so I think in 2008 or one year along the way, my husband attended an SMC and he came and told me this story that uh, one of the courses that they had to take was on retirement preparedness. And the only thing the teacher or the trainer told them was to plant trees. So I want to encourage all of you. Have you planted a tree? Do you have a place you can plant a tree? Because what he told me is that that person told them when you retire and you have to sit under that sun, you will need a shade. How do you stay away from the sun? You've been in an office all your life. You've never needed a place to whatever. The house can be very boring. The four walls can be very enclosing. So if you have a place where you have to retire, you will need to a tree to sit under. And also, should the eventuality happen for people to come and marry you, that's what he told me, <laughs> to find a shed for you to sit, to stand as they see you goodbye. 
But what are the things that you can do as you prepare to retire? And did you remember, retirement is not very bad. Some of the great discoveries were made by people in retirement. Or people were just lazing around. For instance, I think it was Newton, Sir Charles Newton, who discovered the force of gravity while he was sleeping under a tree. And he saw an apple fall down. And he said, voila, this is how, you know, everything that goes up has come down. And that's the force of gravity. And it became a big uh, thing. Um, uh, the KFC, which is a very big brand in America and it's also in Kenya, was started by a colony who had retired at the age of 65 and is now a multi-billion industry of just frying chicken. And he was 65, he retired, he didn't know what to do. So he cooked his favorite meal and invited his friends and they liked it, he patented it and it became a chain. Sometimes when we are bought from cooking, we actually buy KFC. Yeah, it's still here. And uh, it's not as yummy as it is in Kenya. I don't know why. Maybe because in Kenya, it's a foreign concept. When you are at work, networks are very important. And that's why I keep Catherine Musakali very close to me. Because Catherine and I served together at the CCPD many, many years ago. And we have remained friends since. I remember us arguing about minute writing and her teaching us because she was a company secretary and was well schooled in minute writing. And I learned a lot of things from her. What are your networks? Are you in a jama? Are you in a group of people who can come and visit you when you are at home? Who are those people who you call your ride or die? You know, How close do you keep them to you? When was the last time you spoke to your high school classmates? Do you belong to the close uh, school alumni? Do you attend your friends' events? Will they be able to come to yours when that need comes? So for me, networking, creating networks is one thing that we must do as early as we can, wherever we are. One of the networks that keep me going is the network for my 1990 graduation class. People post all manner of things, post all manner of memes, and I've learned a lot because we even have a welfare uh, group started from that class. So the question is, how strong are your networks? Where are the people that you grew up with? Where are those people that you can go back to? Um, <clears throat> and you know, even just sit down and have a cup of tea. Uh, so remember to establish networks as you retire or as you work because they will come in very early. That estate where you live in, the women chamas, you may not like their motionless. They are wanting to know what is in your house or wanting to know, you know, why, which schools your children go to. But they come in very handy because the few times I've been in Kenya, I've been privileged to live in a neighborhood which is um, as all manner of people in Kitengela. And I always have my women group come. We have a cup of tea, we catch up. They tell me what is going on. I'm in the village Chama. And when I need a loan, sometimes they give me. When I need some extra loan, a village, where my, one of the Chama mates will actually stand in for me and say, Josephine, you want additional money you can borrow with my name. So establish those networks because they come in extremely very, very early. Treat people while you're in active life very well. Treat the worker, the tea man, the gate man, in your community, where you are, in the office, with kindness, with courtesy, they serve and play a very important role as you go ahead. Last year, when uh, my father and mother in passed on, some of the people came closest were my former drivers, uh, people I used to engage to drive me around, my clerks. I would take my clerk and run up and down. They're no longer my workers, but I would ask them, Please, can you come and drive me up and down? Treat them well, because you need to use them out there. Sometimes when I want an errand sent done, I just have to call someone in one of my networks, irrespective of what they did. Were you a tyrant? Are you a tyrant at work? Some of us consider ourselves very, very important and terrorize everyone who works under us or around us, or who we think is not at our class level, because we are board members. But I served in the board of Nairobi Water in 2002 
2007. And today when I meet some of the former staff, they still address me as Madam Director. When I have those water bills, I call someone in, uh, thank you Beatrice, my classmate. They, I call someone in the Robbie Water and they say, oh yeah, Madam Director, what is the problem? And they still as, assist me. That was 2002, 2007, close to 20 years. They still remember me. They still uh, um, want to be useful to me. Even those that have gone to other places. So invest in people at home, invest in people at work, invest in people at your place of work, of, of, of residence. Those people that where you live in Kiliman, in Kileleshwa, in Ngong, in Lovington, in Karen, and the people will come to your aid when you can no longer access your office. And an uncle who served um, as a member of Kotu for very many years, and he reached retirement age, but they were afraid to tell him, hey, you're retired. So what he did every day, he drove to the office. At one point, he reached a place where my, we, uh, uh, he had to go with a grandchild to no longer drive. And they would just open the boardroom for him and he would sit. And you know, the day they stopped opening the boardroom, my uncle did not survive beyond five years, he died. He was lost, totally lost. He didn't know what to do with his life because he served this board Kotu until he was 85 years. And so at, at home, I think he was 82 when they let him go and told him, now we need to use the boardroom for other things other than allowing you to come and read the newspaper. So remember that um, you have to have a life away from your office. Remember that busy life, that position that you occupy will need to be, you'll be replaced one time. Um, and so I encourage all of us to remember that retirement is not the end of work. Retirement can also be moving from your current work uh, to another work. Get a hobby while you can. If you are a lawyer, grow onions like I used to do. Farm some chicken, start some, you know, something else that probably doesn't need you now, but can be somewhere where you divert your energy to when Catherine, when you stop working in the bank, uh, I saw Catherine here, she's my friend. And you can go to that place and do something different. If your fashion is fashion, maybe start a designer shop or some online store where you can now sell your shoes, which are your hobby. Those who collect shoes, instead of having a thousand shoes in your wallet, in your closet, put them in a store and sell them, you know? Um, so that it's, 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 it's something that you run back to. Personally, I like collecting. Uh, I, I, I used to love buying uh, bed linen and household stuff. I'm not very um, fashion uh, conscious. I've been a lawyer, I don't have a knife or color. I just know black and blue and I think gray. Uh, but I like bed sheets and pillowcases and blankets and duvets. And so what I did when I had a lot of time in 2019, I went to the shops around here and I discovered the shops that were selling nice bed linen, expensive, cheap, you know, sales, all those things. And I started collecting them. I kept them in my garage. Luckily government has housed me in a big house. And so I have a big garage and took part of my savings and started collecting them. And I discovered how to ship them to Kenya. And so in between, when I come to Kenya, I call my friends and I tell them, you must buy these clothes. We have to share your salary. You must buy these beddings. I need your bedroom to have good bed sheets. You know, when you sleep on that bed, feel nice that you worked and you have that uh, uh, 600 thread uh, bed, uh, 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 it's called a thread count bed sheet that I've sold you, you know? Furnish that chicken, I mean kitchen and, uh, and have whatever. So I turned um, my shopping uh, hobby into something that I could do, maybe not really full-time, but partially 
because it gave me happiness to do it. And so I would go around and um, buy clothes, um, not clothes, buy bed, bed sheets, uh, see very nice dinner sets, see very nice spoon sets, souvenirs. And one time my husband said, did I marry a lawyer or did I marry a trader? Why is my garage full of stuff? And I tell him, don't worry, uh, within the week they will be gone. And he never used to understand where they would go. Uh, so one day when he went home, he just found them full in the garage. And then I told him, don't worry, when I come to Kenya, they will be gone. Which is exactly what I did. When I came for summer, I invited my friends and they actually bought those things. And I was very, very happy because I also realized that I do have taste that other people look uh, like. And so I was very flattered because at one point I said, what if no one likes what I like? Um, so create a hobby that uh, you can fall back into when that time comes for you to retire. Retirement is a family affair. If you are a family. When you are in a family, your husband must be up what your antiques are up to. I used to fight with my husband a lot when he would come from work, he's exhausted, all he wants is to sleep and I want to talk to him. You know, I'm like, I have not talked to another of the whole day. What is wrong with you? You have to talk to me. I was totally insensitive and I felt it was totally insensitive, you know, to my, uh, thank you, CP. I will tell you where they are. I was, you know, we, we started having this friction and I told him, you know, one of these days I'll wake up, leave you with your children and go back to Kenya. I'm a lawyer. I'm an important person. Don't treat me like this. So it can, call, it can be a cause of conflict. If every one of you, uh, uh, someone doesn't realize uh, that you also need to be listened to. So luckily I have a few girlfriends in the US. And so sometimes I tell him, you are staying with the kids. I am going for a girls weekend and I take the plane and I do not want to be asked questions. Do not ask me what I'm going to do. We're going to sit down, gossip and drink wine because I need an adult company other than yours. And so it's a family affair, that's what I'm saying. Your husband, your spouse, your partner, your children must understand that you're also going through some issues that maybe you are not able to manage. When I would get very frustrated, I realized I was taking it out of my kids. And I would tell them, count yourself lucky that I'm here. Huh? I stepped, I left Kenya because of you guys. I abandoned my life for you. Huh? And you're not helping out? And they're teenagers. Then I realized, oh my God, I'm punishing my kids for my own decisions. So I started being a little bit gentle to them. I started having a conversation. I engaged my daughter, who was very excited to watch shopping with me. And then I started paying my son to help me ship. Uh, because uh, I told him, if you want to make some money from me, all you have to do is pack my things. You pack my things, you get your $20, and I'll drive you to your dates. And I'll be there to drive and meet you, because he cannot go on his own, because he's under 18. So it involves everyone around you. Be sensitive to their needs. My son, my baby, who is now seven, tells me, Mommy, I am so happy you do not work, because I thought my auntie was my mom. And that made me really sad. He said, but now I like you. You used to be number five in my list. You are now number two because my auntie is still number one. Fortunately, I still keep his nanny. She's, I came with her and I took her back. She's still in my household. And so they speak and she's number one. I'm still number two. I've not held and that space of being uh, number one in his life because I was absent for a long time. Not really long, but I was busy with my life building a career. As we work, some of the things that um, um, uh, Nasir, Nasirian asked me to speak about was um, we work so hard as women and we work so hard because we have um, an intentional motive to invest for our future. And so I'll meet retirement with also uh, some bit of money issues. I'm not a financial uh, planner, so I'm not telling you about financial planning, but I'm telling you practical issues from my 
career as a lawyer. When I served in the board of FIDA in 2014 to 2016, before I became chair, one of my colleagues who is a judge now was the company secretary for unclaimed financial assets authority. And I'm sure all of you know the UFAA. Those of you who work in the bank know the, return, the requirements of uh, unserviced and dormant accounts. Those of you who work in the insurance industry know what happens to policies that are not cashed and not claimed. And so the government was very clever, realized that banks and insurances were left holding a lot of money that was never collected in their float and suspense accounts. And they created the unclaimed financial assets. I think it's Financial Assets Authority, the UFAA, and asked all these other people who are holding your money, if you don't collect it, to send it to that authority. At one time, the chair of that board was my, class, my friend Katwa, whom I did my master's in Nairobi together. So he was my classmate when I was um, doing my master's in international human rights uh, law in Kenya. So I know him personally. And at one time he told me they were holding in excess of 4 billion Kenya shillings in unclaimed financial assets for Kenyans. And I felt this was an important aspect of today's discussion because a lot of us, and especially us women, suffer from um, lack of trust in our spouses, in our families. And being Africans, we also suffer from that disease of, if I write a will, I am preparing to die. If I write a will and someone knows what I have left them, they may kill me. It is a, nash, it's a concept that we, I think we've grown up in that thing of wills as things that we do when we are dead. So we keep this information to ourselves. No one knows. We forget to put yeah, yeah, it's the UFA. Yeah. Uh, and we do not disclose to anyone what we are doing. I know all of us have that account that no one knows except you. Your egg, your nest egg, where you've kept that money that no one knows, your proceeds from the charmer, your shares from the circle, your dividends from that investment you did with your girlfriends and only you knows how much money you are paid. And then we don't put them in a will. We don't disclose where they are. We never say to anyone. And even because in the past, I don't know whether now it's a requirement, Catherine who is still in the governance sector can tell me, uh, whether we are all required to disclose or declare a next of kin. And that's why government is holding a lot of our money. Before I came, I searched my name and I actually found that I was in UFAA as a person with money in a bank account I don't remember opening in equity. I started the process of finding how much it is, I did not complete. So I'm still in UFAA as a beneficiary of some money and some insurances I paid and I forgot. I discovered that my, I, if you Google your name, because there's a way you can Google your name, you will be shocked that or your mom or your father, those post office books that we used to open a long time ago, they've all been transferred to UFAA. That money that is in your bank account for six months and you don't access it. I don't know what is the threshold now. That money that is in MPESA that you have not withdrawn, there's a requirement in law that it be moved to UFAA. And so this is what I wanted to tie in retirement and succession planning. Remember, other than retirement, there's something that the, I think it is a, a saying, I don't know that it was Shakespeare who said something about death and taxes are inevitable and you must deal and face them. So as you work and invest a lot of man hours in that job, in that position that you get paid. Have someone 
in a position of trust that knows what you're putting your income into. I made a decision in early in my marriage that any asset that I acquire was going to be registered in me and my husband's name, irrespective of who contributed to it. And I warned myself and I said, I know a lot of men and we are afraid that they will get married to other women and they will eat my income. But I said, because I have children with him, should he go and marry Agashungo when I'm no longer there? Shame on him for depriving his kids of what we do. And then therefore I left that decision and that responsibility to be his to make at that time. Assuming I go before him. And uh, I want to ask ourselves, if today you are no longer able to wake up, go to work, and you're dead, and you have these kids, I've told you my kids are seven, 13, and 17. My firstborn will be going to college next year. In fact, as we speak, they're in college too, as in East Coast. And he's seeing universities and planning, because their planning is done in year 11, before they become seniors. Will they have be able to access your hard-earned savings and continue to school? I've handled very sad cases where I've seen big estates wasted because there was no material disclosure of what the person who controlled the assets owned. And I'll mention an important case that I handled. I handled the assets, the estate of the late Oyugi. If those who are old enough, remember the famous important, I think it was a provincial commissioner. And I represented a part of his family. But I remember the estate was so big that not everyone knew what assets he had left. And some of the assets were in his business partner's names and they were never given to the family. Along the way, I dropped out of the case. I have been in the case, I think those of you who are lawyers must have done this in family law, the case of Mutua and Mutua. Catherine, I'm sure you did that case at family law. Mutua and Mutua was a case, and Mutua himself, it's a reported case, and I was a lawyer in it, was a principal immigration officer at those early days, and had a wife and another wife whom I represented. But I remember both wives died before we resolved the estate. Eventually, we resolved the estate and included the second wife's child, children, into what was not given out in the will. Because he had a partial will that he gave out and the other half of the estate was not shared, was not in a will, so we did proper probate. But it took a very long time. I was started when I was in college. I studied that case as a case study in my family law and I handled it in my law firm in the 2000s. And so uh, remember succession, especially when there is no will, can take forever. Those of you who are from Ukambani know of an MP in those early days called Malu. Malu was an MP in 1971 in Ukambani. Believe you me, the succession file is in my office. The succession file is in my office today in 2022. What then happens in the ensuing period, the estate is wasted. Whatever you work for goes into waste and disappears into thin air. Because whoever has the ability to access if there is rent or to access some titles will take and take advantage. And I'm sure a lot of lawyers on this call will tell you that succession is a messy process where there is no law, where there is no way. So I want to encourage all of you today, sit down, you are all educated women, document what you have uh, uh, acquired or you have as an asset, be it land, be it shares in Kenya Airways, like I think I have shares in Kenya Airways and Safaricom, be it um, a charmer that you belong to, 
be it an investment club that you have bought into something, be it the Bitcoins that are today's uh, 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 trending assets, and let someone else know. Document them, put them in a will, write a valid will. Go spend some little money, pay a lawyer to put for you a valid will. Document it. If you own land, if you are courageous enough, you can do what we call in law, a gift in survivors. You can give it in your lifetime. Register it in your children's name. It will then pass. Or register it jointly with you and your children, jointly with you and your husband, so that it passes seamlessly in your death to the next of kin or your co-registered uh, partner. So remember, as you plan for retirement, plan for succession. Disclose those insurance policies you took, you took under pressure from your girlfriend who was selling a policy and I had to make a, pre a sale. Like a lot of my insurance policies, I took them from pressure from my girlfriends who are in the insurance sector and they had to make a sale and I'm a lawyer and they know me and I must buy that policy. Some of them I service, some of them fell by the wayside, some of them are still active. So remember to let someone know. And you can do that by putting it in your will and having it properly done, deposit that will with someone, more than one person, and make sure that you keep updating your will as you acquire assets as you work. You do, we all know what a will is, it's a testamentary document that you say, hi, Josephine Wayua. Wambua Mongari. I own one, two, three today. And should it still belong to me at the time of my death? I want this to pass on to my dear son, my dear daughter, or to be shared among them equally. Succession is messy. Succession does not always end well. Succession causes bitterness and breaks up families. People do not talk to each other. Just make sure. You do yourself and you plan yourself in such a way that when you exit, that money in M-Pesa, m, -Pesa, m does not become the government. I think what the UFA, if I'm not wrong, was part of the people financing the, um, the low cost housing in Nairobi under the government uh, Big Four agenda, because there's a lot of money just sitting there. Who is your next of kin? A lot of us have got next of kins. When we were single, I remember before I got married, my brother was my next of kin. There's one brother of mine I'm very close to. And they used to be my next of kin. Uh, then I got married. I don't know whether I've changed him in all my next of kin declarations. I wrote a will, I gave it to one of my partners. And every time I am very sick, I update my will. If I get a call and I think, hey, this is it, I'm going. I call my lawyer and I say, I need to, I need to update my will. Uh, I could easily go, so please just update it. And now I have this child, just include them in my will. Make sure that your will is up to date with your assets and your perceived beneficiaries where you can. If you own land, transferable assets, and you think you want to be courageous enough, because most of us are not, you can have joint ownership of your real assets. You can register that name in the name of yourself and your husband. If you will not uh, take it to court and, uh, because in any event, our law is about community property. Whether you have registered it in your name or not, if it's within the jurisdiction of Kenya and you divorce, it is community property and it can be shared, whether you acquired it alone or jointly. Uh, also, one is advise yourself because some of us are not, not all of us are subject to the civil laws. Are you in a marriage that is subject to Sharia law? What does Sharia law require? What does the Hindu laws of Kenya require when it comes to uh, 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 succession? Uh, so just warn yourself. I know um, most of us have been victims of what we call verbal wills where your father calls you and say, Jenga hapa, weka uh, inyumba yako hapa, hapa ndiyo kwako. And then that's the end. And when the, your father is no longer there, 
your brothers come and say, this land is my father's. I'm entitled to an equal share to it. So be wary. Uh, yeah, okay, Millicent, I'll do that. Be wary of verbal disclosures or verbal gifts that are no longer not transferable. My sister, uh, my one of my younger sisters, uh, our father-in-law died a long time ago, and the, she was married to the last one in the family. And uh, the old man, as he was growing up, because long time was else would settle their sons, gave uh, his big sons land to settle elsewhere. And then my brother-in-law remained in the family home. And when the father died, believe you me, the brothers should. He came back and said, we are equally entitled to this land. Uko, uko. The titles are in our names, you cannot claim. And we had to go to court. I defended my sister. Eventually, the land was shared six times three brothers and three sisters. And the brothers still selling their shares. So, this is real. Land that is gift, gifted to you verbally is still part of the estate of the deceased if there is no will saying that this should be transferred to your name. I know we cannot force our parents to do wills or, to, I mean, or to subdivide land. And I suffered from that same fate uh, when I told my mom, now we are seven of us, two girls, three daughters, uh, four, five daughters, two boys, five daughters. Can you please divide this land into seven portions? And I paid for a surveyor and my mother refused and divided it into three. Two big portions for the sons and one small portion for what she considers for the girls that will not get married or will come home. And I told my mother, I am not paying for the survey. We'll deal with it. So we all come from patriarchal systems that are ingrained and people will be told, oh, remember anything that I, I learned something when I worked in corruption. If it is not written down, it didn't happen. Whatever you plan to do, document. If you don't document, it didn't happen. It doesn't exist. It's in there your mind, and as we say in law, it's hearsay. It is not substantial. You need evidence. So make sure that whatever you plan to do is documented. I talked about joint ownership and I, Millicent asked me to clarify. You have to make a decision as you acquire your assets because you are working and you're going to acquire your assets. What do you do with those assets? We acquire our assets so that we can fall back on them in old age. And I've seen people now coming to see their fathers and stopping them from uh, selling their assets. So you must warn yourself of the dangers of being stopped by your children from disposing that flat in Kilelesha when you want to go for, you know, a world cruise in retirement, like I'm planning to do next year. Um, take a cruise uh, around the Caribbean uh, islands. Um, and so I may have to sell something. So when you are doing joint registration, the beauty, the advantage of joint registration is that if you are with what we call tenants in common or joint tenants, whatever the registration process the law decides, that the law of the law you decide to take, if you are no longer there, succession is easy because your share passes on to your registered uh, colleague or shareholder. So if it be your husband or your child, it is seamless transfer of that asset to the person who succeeds you. And that's one way of planning it. But warn yourself that you may not be able to transfer it back to yourself should you need it. So it is a question of um, uh, trust levels and what do you do? If you think that you want to keep control, document it in a will, have the will validly you know, put in place. And so it can stand the test of time. It can stand a court case. I want, I think I've been speaking nonstop for one hour and uh, I'd been given one hour and a half for this session. And I want to just summarize by saying, in retirement, find something else that you can do, get a hobby. Remember to involve other people in your retirement planning. And remember to be retirement ready at whatever age and stage of your life you find yourself in. Uh, um, yeah, Lucy Juguna, what happens in some instances where a father writes a will 
and the siblings can't agree. That's why courts exist, so that uh, the court decides whether the will is valid and whether they will uphold by your father's wishes. And remember, a valid will must be witnessed by a party who is not an interested party. So maybe your father wrote the will and called one of the brothers to witness it, and that may make it invalid. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and ask uh, Eunice, uh, because I think I've spoken for an hour and I do not want to deny you people the opportunity to interact, to let me know if anyone wants a clarification. I hope I've covered my brief, according to Catherine and Agnes, uh, and I've done proper submissions before you all. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Josephine. You have done a, a great job. I think you've seen the comments from uh, the participants. And I think there's one clarification Judy asked. Uh, you elaborate on the gift, uh, gifting your children. How is that done? Okay, I, 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 I talked about joint ownership. And uh, I mentioned something we call in law, a gift in the Bible, a gift in your lifetime. A gift in your lifetime, as Catherine and the other lawyers on the call will clarify, is a gift that um, you, you decide um, that this will go to my son and you give it out. If you don't put it in the will, if you transfer it, it ceases to be part of your estate. If you jointly own it and you die, it then becomes something that can be transferred uh, automatically by operation of the law when you are not there. So gifting, you, you can decide that, okay, I have this house and I would like eventually my son to own and occupy it. And you prepare for that time by either putting that child on return 18 into the deed or putting it in a way that it is transferable to them. So the gift can take any format. Do you put their names? Do you put uh, it in the will? Do you disclose, you know, how, how do you make sure that it's, it is passing on without being, because, you know, if you don't do a will, there's what we call uh, a succession. And I'm sure a lot of you have had things called letters of administration. There's something we call uh, uh, succession without a will where you do um, um, interim letters, gazette it, advertise it to the world, let people file claims, and the process takes long. After six months, you can now start confirming the estate. It's a long process. That is a legal process. It requires a whole legal session to teach you the Succession Act and the Constitution and equality and all that. But if you, as a person in your planning, says, this is my apartment. I bought it. I'm collecting rent from it. But now, I think if I still own it, I would like it to pass to my son. You can put it in the will and control and continue to control it. If you continue to control it, um, then at the end, if the will is not challenged, it's easy to pass it on to, to, the, to the person you have assigned it. But if you put the name of that person in the title, in the deed, then there is what we call um, joint ownership and ownership in common. Depending on the what you have called it, is it joint ownership or ownership in common? I don't want to go to the legal definitions. It can successfully just be transferred to that person in the eventuality of your death. So it's 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 the it, you, you need to get a lawyer to tell you okay. and to tell them your wish, what you want to do. This is not a topic that we can go here because that's a whole realm of a legal process. So you can indicate my son, my daughter, this is what I want to put them in. It is it, it is it. Thank you. Georgina is asking, what mm -hmm. are those three or four Ian. or five indicators? Ian. Rose, Rose please Maura. put your mic off. Mm. So what are those three or four, five indicators that uh, show that I am fully prepared for retirement? Okay, um, my sister Georgina, as I said, I was not retired. I found myself having to make a decision 
to step aside from my busy life. And so uh, the, the German Benefits Act has asked people to create uh, pension plans and all that. That is something you're supposed to do in your early working life. Those of us who have been self-employed for a long time, we are unfortunate because we don't have proper managed retirement benefits. And so we may not be ready for retirement. We may still be hoping to make, there's something we call, you know, a great benefit. That big uh, uh, transaction that will say to us that may never come. So as I said, um, plan for retirement. You may not be ready when you are called to retire, but there are things that you can do that will cushion your retirement. I represented a client a long, long time ago. And uh, one of the things she told me is that uh, her father was a businessman in Ukambani, those early days told her, the house you sleep in, that title deed should not be in a bank. So that's one thing that Georgina, you need to know. Where you sleep every day, if that house belongs to you, Work very hard to make sure that by the time you're retired, it should not be in a bank. Georgina is an accountant. There is a, 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 a formula that you people use, the one third uh, income levels that you need to have to be able to live on in retirement. I don't know the formula. I've attended a few retirement uh, planning sessions and there's that thing you're told, make sure that you can access at least one third of your current income in, in retirement. But one of the lessons that I learned from my client was, if you are able to secure where you live, where you call your home, and it is not mortgaged at the time you're retiring, then you are halfway to retirement rate. Because if you keep the chicken at the backyard, cage now I hope the country will not come inspecting and find that you're keeping animals without a license in the city, then you are partly towards retirement. The other thing is, what will you do with those many hours, Regina, when you don't have to go to do those accounts, when you don't have those many clients that need you, or when you don't have the capacity to do it, what else can you do? Hmm? What else can you do? Are you having something else to do? Can you sell bed sheets like this? <laughs> Can you start, you know, I'm, I'm just giving you an example. Can you, and do you have a hobby? Do you have something else you like other than crunching numbers? So those are the things that I'm talking about. Find something that else, that something else can do that you can, I mean, that you can do. Now that practice, Georgina, which you learn, run now and it's yours. Can you step aside and be comfortable that somebody is going to manage it? Yesterday, I was talking to my partner in the office and I told her, you know, you're my pension plan. Please manage the farm so that you can be sending me some money because I'm not doing any court work. Um, I, I see documents, yes. I approve some of the documents, yes. But I'm not the one who goes to make sure they are registered. Somebody in the office has to do that. Can you step back from your baby the practice and be comfortable that somebody else is doing it and that it still is what you envision. Have you, in other words, empowered the people around you to be able to step into your shoes when you become the wife of the ambassador, to Gina? Hmm? When we post you to uh, Turkey, hmm? Istanbul, and you, all you have to do is wake up and once a month, like I do, is go to a dinner for uh, spouses of uh, diplomats. That's the only highlight of your month. What else, can somebody else run that business? So do we have businesses that can succeed ourselves? That's what I'm saying. Can I, I, I know Kathleen started these women on boards as part of retirement planning. She was very wise. And she has brought us all together and see how busy she's gotten, you know? Can you do that? Is there something else you can do? Must it be crunchy? numbers. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. I'll allow Judy to unmute and ask her second question. Judy Chumu. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my question is uh, the issue of joint ownership. I think I didn't come out clearly. Um, I'm asking in the sense that you have died, you did a joint ownership. Can you dictate the, the transaction of the house? Maybe you dictate like 10 years to or 20 years to, this child can now sell the house. This is with anticipation that by the time you are transferring to them, they are not mature. So you do estimation 10 to 20 years, they will, they will be people of sound mind mature and they can do an objective transaction. Thank you. Mm, oh, well, I think you, you have very little control when you're dead. You hope for their wisdom. You hope that it will help them. And I think one of the things that we do as mothers is to invest so much in the emotional well-being and the, the outcome of what our children begin to become. We forget that they are also individuals in their own right. For me, uh, what I encourage my friends and family to do is release your children to be individuals in their own right, you know, so that those children can make decisions that benefit them. Remember, when you put that asset, you are hoping it will benefit. But we have had cases whereby as soon as the matriarch or the patriarch of the family has died, the estate is thrown into chaos, people have sold the properties that they inherited, they've drunk themselves to death. I managed an estate where someone uh, drank himself to death. So uh, are they wise enough? Have you raised responsible children, responsible themselves? They need to know that the asset now no longer benefits you. It benefits them. So if you lay the foundations well when they are young, at that point, then that asset benefits them. But if they still need your control when you are dead, my dear, you're backing up the wrong tree. So it is a question of, as you raise your children, what are you raising them to become? Independent adults who are able to see the value in something that you invested in, or people will waste the estate as soon as they bury you. You know, uh, one of the, uh, the crises we have in FIDA in Kenya is old people in Cliffy are killed by their young kids because they want to inherit the land and sell it to investors along the beach. You know that. That's a big challenge. And we worked on several of those cases. In FIDA, we have a running program at, in Cliffy. Why? Because those kids look at their parents as being impediments to they are accessing the and you know the wealth that comes with disposing of that land are those your children, you know. So there is not much you can do when you're dead, Judy, but you raise responsible adults and you know that in your death, whatever you are put out there for them will benefit them. If it doesn't benefit them, you've done your bit. That's how I look at it. But you can't dictate. You you can put it in a will, but who tells you they're going to respect it? There is no law that binds them. You know, once you passed on the asset, that is it. If you do your will and you put it in an executor, assuming the administrator or the executor of the will does not waste it in the process, it can be held for a while. But as they say in 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 in, in French, that is life. C'est la vie. Thank you. Just a follow-up question to that, uh, Josephine. Uh, mm -hmm. Rufina is asking, in my will, I have designated my lawyer as an administrator. How would, how would the administrator legal cost be controlled so that they don't take up more than is due to them as an administrator? I think we've seen this in some of these uh, big families that have been left, and it's the lawyers and administrators that actually end up spending a lot of the money. That's a good question. Maybe just give us and any other legal person can support you. I, I, I would want to ask her to have a discussion with our lawyer. Determine legal fees and document them. Okay? Determine legal fees, document them, have an agreement. Like here, I, I went to school last year, so I have the benefit of recent learning. And one of the things I learned was uh, client lawyer engagement and uh, the American system is such that you could have, you can have a contract of how much fees will come out of a transaction. For the lawyer, you're a file. And so, of course, they want to manage you as a file. Have you agreed on fees? 
go and discuss the fees with your lawyer. It is allowed by Kenyan law. The Advocates Act allows it. There is a scale. You can negotiate it. You can document it. Thank you. I think she was asking if you if you are not there, if you expire, are you able to pre-negotiate? I'm saying you negotiate now because you are engaging that person now. Ah, okay. Yeah, you are engaging them now. You are engaging them at okay. this stage when you are okay. still alive. Okay. All yeah. right. But I would want her to seek legal advice. This was not a legal advice session. This was retirement <laughs> discussion. All right. <laughs> yeah. And then Inviolata is asking, how do you balance between all this and raising the family without stretching yourself thin? And maybe just to add on to that question, uh, you talked about uh, your law firm is still going on. What happened to the 5,000 chicken you had? Are you still running that also? In December of 2008, I called the guy who used to buy my layers, you know, the ex layers, and I sold him the chicks when they were still laying, because that was not a business I could sustain. And then I, I fortunate enough, because I at the cage system, I got um, some lady wanted to start farming and I sold off my equipment. Uh, so, and I closed the law firm branches, by the way. I closed mm -hmm. Makweni, I closed Kitengela, um, and I remained only the Nairobi office so that that law firm uh, was able to support itself. So I released the lawyers who were in those other branches and they helped them settle. One of the things I did is even in my farm, because I had a shamba with a lot of workers, I found places for them to work. I let them go. So nowadays when they hear that I'm in Kenya, they come through for me. <laughs> so I, I left with a good, and I had enough time to plan because we were posted in November and we were moved in May. So I had six months planning period. So I settled my, my, my estate. Now, how do you balance the competing interest of raising a family, working and retirement planning? Uh, I attended as, I, I have a friend called, um, all of you know, Professor Kamere Bote, and she talks about women with wives. And so I invested in a wife. I have a wife as a woman. So I have a nanny who raised my kids. And she has been with me for, I think, the age of all my children. Uh, Catherine Nyaga knows her. Uh, I hosted Catherine in my home, and she met Agnes. And uh, I invested in her, and she's the one who was technically, she's the one my, my last consent says that she's number one in his life. Uh, so I invested in her and I invested in her children. I made sure they went to school. One of the sons is graduating this year with a degree. I made sure that the other kids were supported and they got something to do. Uh, and she's been very good to me. And she helped me raise my kids. This is because I got my kids in the middle of my career when I was already out there and I, I, I had to balance between being a lawyer, being a feeder chair, being a board member, and writing judgments at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, and also being there for my kids. So we have to invest in the people around us for us to help uh, whatever. And that's the people that can, uh, Professor Bote calls wives, women with wives. How are you treating that person who raises your kids for you? How do you plan your life so that you get to spend some time with your kids? When we were in Kenya, we always had August, as the month for going for holiday. And so we all went to Mombasa and spent a week together. Here, of course, I don't have anything else to do. Um, um, and uh, uh, I, I now talk to my kids and I encourage them to do their laundry and those who love to cook to cook and those who want to clean the house to clean the house. So it's a question of balancing their emotional needs because I have teenagers. And they are very crazy. They are very cranky. My daughter can be mad for a whole day and not talk to any of us. My son can refuse to come out of his room if you refuse to drop him at uh, his girlfriend's date and all that. And uh, we are in an environment that they are very aware of what their rights and what they are entitled to, as opposed to Kenya. So I had to learn very quickly to adapt and stop being mukali. Uh, Otherwise, they would have run away or reported me to the police. But we have to learn the balancing act. That's why we are women. We more task. So you have to give your family the space. Listen to your husband who is complaining and bitching. 
and also being mad at you or drinks once in a while and forget to come home. You know, all those things we have to deal with. So you have to manage yourself as a career. And I think personal management should be uh, an, another topic. Catherine would love to bring us another expert to talk about how they've done it. We have successful women who are balanced marriage, balanced family, have successful kids, have successful outcomes in their marriages because they learned how to plan. So it's just a question of having some bit of wisdom as in your planning and in what you do. Thank you so much, Josephine. We have actually come to the end of our time. Um, it would be good for me to actually give some takeaways and just summarize some of the things you've given us uh, to think about. Um, a lot of uh, thank you and um, from, from everyone who has attended and wake up calls for most of us. And I think for me, what I've done is just summarized it into questions. So these are questions you'll answer for yourself. Do you have a shed? Um, do you have a network? Your network is your net worth. Do you have a hobby? Um, this is not a question, but treat people well now that you're, you're working and even whoever you meet in your life, you never know when you need them. Retirement is a family affair. You can't plan retirement alone. And I think Josephine has told us very many things we should do. So one of them, don't be part of the people with assets under UFA. So prepare your will, document all your things, uh, document anything you think is important. Do you have a next of kin? And do you have a wife? I think, I think that is, especially now when we are juggling so many things, do you have a wife and a good support system? I think, I think just, Josephine, I hope I've done justice, a summary of what you have uh, talked to us today. And for me, you're, you're going to be part of my net, network for sure. So Catherine will, be, will give me your contacts for sure. And I'll, I'll, I'll summarize who you are based on just this time I've met you. I think you're bold, you're brave, you're versatile, and you're wise. You've given us words of wisdom and you don't take that for granted. And thank you for taking your time. I'll ask Catherine to give some closing remarks and then I shall give updates of the upcoming events. So Catherine, over to you. Wow. Thank you very much, Eunice. Thank you, thank you so much. Can we just all unmute and give out a shout out to Josephine? I think it was wonderful. Please just unmute for this one. Thank you, Josephine. Well done. Thank well you. done. This this has been insightful. I mean, the takeaways are amazing. And I'm, I'm, I'm just going to uh, request um, the secretariat to actually just summarize a few of those points, um, like the ones that Unis has done, so that we share them in as much as we shall share the recording, so that we share them with the rest of the members, because this has been awesome. Josephine, I can't thank you enough. This has been deep. This has been life-changing for me. And I am sure that it has been very, very impactful to the rest of the members. Thank you. We can't thank you enough. Thank you, everybody, for making this um, such a wonderful, wonderful session. Back to you, uh, Eunice. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I would like to give some updates of upcoming events. We are going to have uh, on the 24th, of March, uh, the board talk series on ESG, why it matters. So please diarize that. We're going to have the board profiling and personal positioning workshops. This the workshop is going to be on uh, two dates, 31st March uh, this month, and then 5th of April. And then there's the eighth anniversary of breakfast and round tables. This will be a physical event uh, at Staruma Pan Africa on the 9th of April. So those are the upcoming events, at least for the next two months. So please diarize that. Then look out for the next uh, um, um, session that we're going to have. And I'm sure we'll have another exciting topic. And for me, it's just to say thank you to the Secretariat for making this possible, to the Chair Catherine. And again, Josephine, pass our regards to your family. And, and we pray for a good day for you. 
a good a blessed evening for all of you a good weekend and thank you to all of you for joining this session have a good evening looking forward to having you back Josephine. thank you Catherine. it was a pleasure okay thank you okay. thank, thank you very you. much for our thank you evening. have thank a you. lovely weekend and thank you Thank you, Josephine. Bye, Josephine. This is Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.